Has anybody got to see this bird before in the wild? This is one of our warblers that comes through called the Blackburnian warbler. Many of the Blackburnian warblers head north into New England, upstate New York, Canada, uh, into the spruce forests. But some of them will stay here and just go up to Mount Mitchell and to the Appalachian spruce fir forest and the Smokies. They love the spruce trees and they're just a resplendent bird to see. You know, beautiful throw called them flame throats or sometimes fire throats. And well, welcome back in. Uh, we made it through the, the get dirty part of our class. Uh, hopefully there's some mud on your clothes somewhere, or like some twigs in your hair. Part of my life's work is to encourage people to go out and get dirty and, you know, like give your washing machine something to really wash, you know, besides a few wine stains. A big part of my life is trying to encourage people to build a closer relationship with the life that is here on our planet for us to realize that every place we have our homes and our yards uh, and our agricultural fields too uh, no matter how organic we are that uh, if we're living in southern Appalachia uh, we have cleared forest in order to live here as humans we have a big impact on the environment and so I think when we're trying to decide what lifestyle we want to live what choices we want to make to have as little impact as possible on the environment, well, that's almost impossible to do. That is impossible to do if we don't understand the environment that was here first, if we don't understand the ecology that was happening. What are the communities that we're even disrupting? How do they work? How do they fit together? So I really encourage folks just as a regular part of their lives to, to go out and take walks in the woods and maybe even wander off trail a little bit, you know, maybe even squat down and, and look at a mushroom closely. Get yourself a nice little magnifying lens that you can use to look at wildflowers or salamanders. Um, and when we take that time and we slow down and, and, and we dig for something into, in the bushes to see a closer look at that nest, you know, uh, then we get all kinds of stories that come. It's in those moments where we've slowed down and we're taking the time to be curious that suddenly for the first time in a long time, a fox shows itself. And I say shows itself because I don't think it's just that we happen to see a fox sometime or that we happen to have a hawk fly across the field and land right in a tree above us. I actually think part of that is us reaching out with our curiosity us reaching out with our imagination and our focus. And we give those things attention and they feel it. And many times they'll respond to us and we'll get to see more wildlife than our friends or neighbors thought was possible. They'll start coming to you, you know, the more and more you spend time getting into the wild stuff and like seeing and quieting your mind and listening, the more and more you're gonna have these stories to tell and your neighbors are just gonna think you're a kook. They're gonna be like, oh, here comes Sally with another story about seeing black bear or, you know, another like flying squirrel lives in their attic or something like that. So anyway, I just want to encourage that, that whole like sticks in our hair, mud on our knees culture. Uh, let's not try to reserve that for children. I think that's a very mature adult thing to do. Okay. Birds and birdsong, an introduction to identifying birds on the landscape. So I put this little slideshow together with the hopes that it has some practical tips for the practice of bird watching and bird observation and learning the different species of birds around us. First of all, I'll ask you all this question. Why do you bird? What brought you here? What made you interested in this workshop? Why look at birds? They're all around us. They're everywhere. All around us. Yeah, how did I get through high school without one class naming one bird that lived where I lived? I had to skip class to learn birds. I did. Micah, don't listen to me. Yeah, just um, I find that when it comes to being in nature, just having some sort of like anchor for why I'm in nature is really helpful for me to actually spend time there and, and be outside. So learning the names of things and being able to kind of focus my attention and, and be more engaged, it's really helpful, so I've never done that with birds. Well, some people can listen to classical music and have to know what the piece is. I can just enjoy classical music. 
I can't enjoy birds without knowing what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I'm out there and I see a bird, I've just got to know what that bird is. So I got to go get my book. I got to, you know, I got to see it. Uh, so there's there's similarity there. Absolutely, I'll tell you. I, my background is mostly with plants. You know, I kind of came to a lot of the natural world, world by uh, studying plants and, and learning. Uh, particularly edible and medicinal plants, but also just wildflowers in general, I, I've been super fascinated with. And so as a botanist, um, you know, I'm trying to learn about 6,000 plus species of plants in Eastern United States. That takes a little while, <laughs> right? And, and that's besides the mosses that I'm really interested in and the liverworts, and that's besides mushrooms, a whole different kingdom. and, and um, so just to say, when we're talking about birds, and I'll get into numbers in just a minute, much smaller group, much more learnable, and we can take the time and learn probably every bird that will ever visit our yard and learn their names and a little bit about them. It's a very doable group, I think. Yeah. Anybody else, just a reason why you left a bird, please? For me, I just love them. It's just love listening to them, love being outside and part of them, and and I guess learning who is making which noises will just expand on that. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's really fun to learn different species and the different cultures and traditions that each species has and like the similarities that almost all Phoebes share and how it's different than the personality of a tufted titmouse or a cedar waxwing and to just get to know them as groups. And yet birds are just beautiful, right? How many poetry books are written about birds and how often do we reflect on birds uh, and the freedom that they have just, just to escape the bonds of gravity and, and how often do we just like wish that we had the ability to just fly at, at will. What an amazing, what an amazing thing. So I wrote down here a few of my favorite reasons. Uh, beauty, they're just beautiful. Even the bully of a blue jay, I could just watch that beautiful blue feathers of that bird or the indigo bunting is another one that Actually, I just heard across the street a little bit ago, indigo buntings are out and singing a lot right now. Ah, oh, and that blue shine, it's like electric blue and got buzzed by a hummingbird this morning as I was leaving home on its way to blossoms in our garden. And then of course I've mentioned ecological responsibility a number of times already. We've got some work to do right now. Birds are so fantastic at helping us step into ecological responsibility in part because so many of them are migrants. They actually encourage us to do something as humans that's sometimes difficult for us as humans, which is reach out to people of other places and other cultures. We won't have any scarlet tanager. This is a scarlet tanager that happens to have a little bit of its immature plumage still on it. It's still molting into its mature plumage, so it's got bright yellow like it does as a female or in its immature stage. Uh, kind of looks like some interesting flavor of ice cream, huh? Or something like that, like banana strawberry swirl. But scarlet tanagers are long distance migrants. You know, they're coming thousands of miles to get here. And we can't just protect our ecosystems for this bird to survive and for this species to carry on. We actually have to understand what's happening for this bird, not only on its wintering grounds, which is somewhere in the tropics, but all of its stops along the way. We need to invest in relationships and encourage practices that are helpful for all of the habitats of this bird, which I think is especially important, I would say, for the United States and Canada to do, because we've had a habit sometimes of taking some of our industry that is more destructive to the environment and just putting it into other countries that are poorer and have less regulations. And that's actually come back to bite us in the butt really hard around some of our bird conservation, where we're like, oh yeah, now what the things that we're no longer doing in the United States are affecting birds uh, on their way back up here to visit us. I thought it was worldwide, 60% of avian biomass now is now commercial. It's for you know yeah. poultry and uh, you know, so it's like the, the percentage of, of, of birds in the world that are being used for commercial use is growing at the expense of, expense of the, the wild bird, I guess. I wonder how many pounds of chicken and turkey that is on the, on the planet. Ecoliteracy is another piece I have up here. And that's just, again, to say that only 100 years ago, I think any average 12-year-old or 40-year-old or 72-year-old 
would have had a lot more environmental knowledge than our young generations do today. Simply the fact of interacting with the farm or interacting with the homestead, uh, those things alone would have given you a lot more knowledge of poison ivy and Phoebe's nesting under the eaves and all sorts of pieces of information when the raspberries ripen, uh, when, the, when the blueberries are ready, how to tell an unripe blackberry from a ripe blackberry even if they're both black. Just lots of little details that we would have had in our common talk I think are now no longer there in, because we're living in environments that are void of a lot of our native plants and thus sometimes a lot of our native birds and other species. Our eco-literacy, I think, has dropped quite a bit in our industrious and suburban and urban environments. That's a revelation that you know is, is certainly on the minds of a lot of our citizens these days. I feel like lots of people want to have access to wild spaces if they live in an urban or suburban area. Lots of folks who live in beautiful areas like we do around Asheville and Brevard and Hendersonville, we still have a lot of access and there's a lot of access to the National Forest. But I have to say we're largely the exception, not the norm. So it's neat for me to travel and teach other places where I hear communities working together to make community parks, to have uh, people leading bird walks regularly, to have local Autobahn chapters, even if they're just a small town, or a regional chapter where people drive for miles and miles so they can get together and bird together, or look at wildflowers, etc. Uh, I am feeling like that's back on the rise, which I'm really happy about. And the, one of the tricks has been to try to get young people back involved, because I have to tell you, for years and years, I've been studying plants and lichens and mosses and birds, and I'm like, have often been the only person without white hair in the crowd. You know, there was a large group of people who were interested and that population has shrunk considerably. So trying to make this attractive to young people has actually been one of my big projects, especially with birds. I've been trying to go for it and I have had a number of uh, teenage bird apprentices now. And so it's, it's catching on. I think it's becoming sexier for young people to, to know all their birds and all the bird songs and just be like, Carolina Wren singing. You know, got it. Oh, that's probably because it has the nest in the backpack out there on the porch. Oh. Yeah. I predict the organization list that this year is Year of the Bird. And yeah. it's with the Big Bird Conservation Group. I forget. National Geographic sponsored it. Yeah. So they have actions you can take every day if you're interested in conservation. They have little tips to help engage people to get more involved with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to go into further resources as well. And if anyone also wants to share there, uh, we'll talk about the Audubon Society and ways to get involved locally. Species diversity. So worldwide, we have about 10,000 species of birds. There are still new species being discovered. There are still species becoming extinct, so that number fluctuates. But 10,000 is a decent number to get an idea of how many birds we have. That makes birds our most diverse and abundant tetrapods. Tetrapods are things with four major appendages, so like two legs and two arms. In North America, I put the number 700, some folks would say 750, some folks would get it closer to 800. It depends if you count all of the little islands off of Alaska and the occasional birds that blow in for like one day of the year from a storm from uh, far Eastern Asia. You know, it depends where you draw the lines and who you're counting, but we have something like 700 or 750 birds fairly commonly seen in the United States each year. That's a pretty good number, 700 birds. That's, that's good diversity. But check it out, 400, over half of those birds pass through the state of North Carolina. From the Outer Banks to the borders with Tennessee, we have 400 species that at some point come through North Carolina. That's awesome that as a state we can have representation of more than half of the species in the, in the continent. That's a, a cool place to be. Check it out though, it gets even better. If you live in Western North Carolina, 225 species that pass through these mountains here. That's a great number of birds. 170 of them will actually stick around and breed in Western North Carolina. And just to say like, that's phenomenal. Uh, Piedmont, if you head down to the Chapel Hill area, you're looking at only about 80 to 90 species that stay and breed in the Piedmont. So the diversity of the topography and the environmental niches that we have in the mountains here create a lot of cool different habitats 
and again, ecological niches that allow for a lot of different species of plants and insects and thus birds to be here and find the environments that they like. So if you're interested in birding, you're in a great spot. Identification tools and techniques. This is what the next 12 or more slides is about. And I just did it as a starter off. We're gonna talk about binoculars, field guides, bird listing, what is being a life lister, silhouettes, bird song, habitat, location on the landscape, behavior, time of year and seasons, and the honoring routine. So a number of these things we've touched on this morning, I'm gonna go into them a little bit more right now. Anybody tell me what bird number 14 is? I was just joking, actually. <laughs> How about that one right there? It is morning dove. Ding, 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 ding. Awesome. Um, any guesses on that one there? It's a red-tailed hawk. Now, how did you know beyond a hawk that it was a red-tailed hawk? Wide wings. Really wide wings. What else? The fan tail. And this nice wide fan tail that's not very long, not as long as like a turkey vulture's tail. Anybody have any guesses on this one here with the long tail and the pointed? Mm -hmm. That is indeed a falcon. It could be a peregrine falcon or a merlin. Awesome. Boy, you all are passing the test. Who is uh, this right here? Cardinal. Probably a northern cardinal, yeah. So I'm really impressed. And the Peterson's field guide has silhouettes, two to four pages of different silhouettes in them, and they're fun to quiz yourselves. This is one of those things that takes a while to learn. But, you know, when you, when you have a new neighbor or when you make a new friend, uh, it's not going to be long before you'll start to get a sense of what that person often wears, um, what their posture is like, right? You can probably identify me just by me doing this. <laughs> um, what their laugh sounds like at a distance. You know, when you really get to know someone, you can walk into a potluck uh, dinner. Maybe one of you is going to have a potluck dinner sometime in the next few months uh, where the theme is birds and talking about birds. That'd be a nice little idea. And, uh, but, you know, maybe there's 50 people in, in a room, but you recognize your friend across the room, even with their back turned towards you. Maybe because you heard their laugh, maybe just their, their posture, maybe it's the way they do their hair, but there, there's little hints that we can pick up on and as we get to know birds uh, that will happen here. So binoculars is a conversation to have. I feel like you do not need binoculars to become a great birder. Matter of fact, I know a number of fantastic birders who are blind, they can't see anything. And binoculars are a pretty awesome tool. It's one of those things like when you rub the genie bottle and you get three wishes, you know, or, or you might get like three, three superpowers, like binocular vision. I, I don't know that it would be in, the, in my top five, but like now that I've really gotten hooked on binoculars, it's hard for me to go anywhere without them. It's just this superpower that's right there in your hands and you go like this and all of a sudden you can see something very far away. It's a little bit like one of the superpowers of a lot of our birds, particularly those beautios, those big hawks, Red tail hawks are said to be able to see a meadow vole like this big at a hundred, is it a hundred yards? It is, it's a hundred yards away. So the length of a football field, which is convenient because like meadow voles like their favorite snack. So think of your favorite snack. Let's see, for me, it might be cinnamon roll with like the really gooey center and like the pecans on the top. You know what I'm talking about? And can you imagine being able to see, oh no, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not 100 yards away. I gave you the wrong information. It's a mile. Red-tailed hawks can see a meadow vole at a mile away. That's important. Because now I want you to imagine being able to see that snack you just pictured in your mind at a, a mile away. Wouldn't that be handy? I'd just be like, whew, cinnamon roll, you know, and I would just go right forward. That would be fantastic. Do you recommend a particular Eight by 42s. I recommend that and I almost every year have a student who will come up and be like, I actually went for the 12 by 42 and like thinking like they did a great job and they got it at a similar price, even cheaper. And I'm just like, oh, uh, there are places for higher magnification. But generally what's happening is this, is um, if you make something bigger, this is the same thing that, that you'll find if you use microscopes, if you make something bigger, then you're actually reducing 
the amount of light traveling from that object to your eyes. You're, you're taking that, that focus of light and you're stretching it out. It'd be as if you took a flashlight and instead of focusing it in a small spot, you made it 10 or 12 times bigger, it would be dimmer. And so what happens is as you magnify something greater, less light comes to your eye. And that light is gonna, what's gonna show you the details and give you the color and give you the crispness of the image. Another thing that happens is if I want to focus on something and make it much bigger, uh, as I make that bird go from this big to this big, what's going to happen is it's going to fill my entire field of view. And so 8 by 42s when I look at something, I actually have a pretty big field of view that I can see. So if that bird decides to jump, it's in my binoculars right now. From one branch to another branch, it'll probably stay in my binoculars. If not, I'll have enough distance around the bird I can kind of follow it. <laughs> On the other hand, if I have a 10 by 42 or, or a 12 by 42, um, the bird will be bigger, but I won't have very much space around the bird to see. And so when the bird jumps, I won't have any idea where it went. I'll have to search for it till I find it again. Um, Something like a 12 by 42 can be good if you're um, doing mostly water birding. If you have um, 5,000 ducks out on a lake and, and a lot of them are really far away and you're trying to look through the ducks and see where you have a redhead, where you have a canvas back, how many are ruddy ducks, because they're not moving much and you want just something big. They're not jumping around very much. You're not trying to catch them in the air, although sometimes you are. So I would recommend generally towards Eight by 42s is your good pair of binoculars as far as dimensions go. Um, after eight by 42, things to think about are um, uh, what's going to affect the price will be the quality of the glass and the quality of the lamination. You know, you might have noticed that my binoculars, if you saw the light shine on them, they might have looked purple in the end. Usually there's a purple or blue filter, and that's a laminate that is made so that when the light comes to the glass, it doesn't bounce off. It actually like allows it to not bounce off and just get pulled in. And so right now, if I were to take my binoculars and look into a dark closet, it would appear brighter than if I even use my naked eyes. So they're not just magnifying, they're also increasing the light that's coming into your eyes. So that's a, that's a cool thing. Quality of glass um, helps with tr color trueness and clarity. And uh, you know you can get a great pair of eight by forty twos for a hundred bucks these days. That would have been hard to do just fifteen years ago, but really good quality now. If you want to go fancier than that, there's all kinds of things. I mean, it's not hard to go out and find a two thousand dollar pair of binoculars. And if you got that extra change, talk to me afterwards. Let's figure something out. Um, but but don't let price inhibit you from from birding. You can get great binoculars for a hundred bucks. Uh, and again, if you go up higher than that, you're just getting slightly better qualities, slightly better qualities. They'll have fancy things that will keep your binoculars from fogging. Um, you might have to pay an extra 50 bucks for waterproofness. So if you drop it off the canoe or the kayak and then you can pull it out of the water and it's still good to go, it's not going to leak because they fill it with a certain kind of gas, um, that kind of stuff. There's, there's, little, there's little perks as you go up in price. So practicing spotting objects, really important because all of a sudden that, that hooded warbler, that Blackburnian warbler can jump into that tree. And if you're fast at getting it into the binoculars, you might be able to watch it for a good minute or two before it jumps somewhere else. But if you spent that minute or two trying to get your binoculars on it, you saw it, it was right on that branch, but it took you a while to get the binoculars there. And by the time you focus on it, it might be about to jump away. So just doing that thing, do, yeah. You can just walk down your street doing that. Your neighbors will think you're weird. They might call the cops. It'll be fun. A wide angle vision. Again, I'll often head out. Um, I'll hear a bird fly into a tree. I might have lost track of it. I just saw it fly in there. I'm just going to pause and I'm going to use wide angle vision. As a matter of fact, I might do something called owl eyes, which is like where I'm widening my vision. Woo! So I can see uh, things on my periphery so I don't just bump into stuff randomly. <laughs> And I'm just wiggling my fingers so I can see how wide that I can see. Great, that's where I want to be. And I'm looking at the tree, trying to be as wide as possible. When I'm doing that, I'm going back to the kind of seeing we use a lot when there's predators around, where we want to see movement. And movement becomes really obvious when I'm not focusing on one thing. Once I see the movement, that's where the bird is. Now I can put my binoculars on it. Please. 
Um, I just heard from a friend who does um, body work that when you do that kind of softening of the vision, where you're just kind of softening your gaze and you're just bringing your attention to your periphery, um, that also calms your nervous system. Oh, awesome. I, sh I sure feel it myself. Matter of fact, one of, I, I've been a meditator for a lot of my life, and one of the things I love most about birding is in order to hear the songs, I have to quit thinking. If, if I have thoughts going through my head, I'm not going to hear the birds. It's got to be quiet upstairs. And um, I think that's probably what's helped me hold on to the little bit of sanity. I'm still holding. Sun at your back when possible. Today, there wasn't that much sun to be had. It didn't matter too much. Even though, even with that though, when a bird was up against a brighter part of the sky, it was harder for us to see the detail. We were like, is that a mockingbird or a catbird or it's a gray bird? A lot of the birds were looking a little gray today. Uh, looks like the sun is peeking out a little bit. We'd probably get more color now. Um, because of this though, if you get to know a spot, maybe there's a park you like to walk in or your yard is good for birding. One of the things you'll wanna do is when you choose your route, choose the route that situates you so the sun is behind you at the trees you like to look at because you know that the Orioles have been in there before or, or some, the people who live next door have a bird feeder. I'm gonna walk myself in a way where instead of the bird feeder be, being between me and the sun, I'm gonna walk on the other side so that the sun is at my back. You'll be able to see a lot more birds that way. You can't always get the birds to be right where you want them to be, but sometimes they cooperate a little bit. Which pair to buy? I have a link that I can give you all. It's a nice thing that Autobahn put out about great binoculars for less than 300 bucks. And there's a lot of different brands out there right now. I've been really enjoying the Vortex Diamondbacks, 8x42s, and the Nikon Pro Staffs. Both of those are about 150 bucks. Have lifetime warranties and they're just great, great binoculars. Um, oh, I know one last thing I wanted to mention is with binoculars, uh, some folks have trouble because one of their eyes are different than the other. Almost every pair of binoculars is set up to be able to adjust to, to different eyes. Um, there's simply, there's a dial in the middle and then there's a little dial on the right hand eyepiece. And what you'll do is you'll stand firmly in one place, focus on something about 20 or 30 yards away with only your left eye and use the main focus. Once I can see I, Micah's iris over there perfectly in focus, then I close my left eye, open my right eye, and now I focus the right lens only with that separate adjuster, not the main focus, but the separate focus lens. That way you can adjust any pair of binoculars to your eyes, even if one eye is different than the other. Um, I can give a little demo on that at lunchtime if it's nice. Okay, practice. So there's a lot of different field guides out there. And I think they're all great. They just have kind of different focuses or slightly different features. I really recommend starting with a regional field guide, one that's Birds of North Carolina. I've got a couple guides over here, Birds of North Carolina. Uh, Birds of the Smokies is a great way to go. Oh good, I'm hearing an Oriole outside. Start with one that's regional, at least start with one for Eastern United States. If you try to start, begin birding with a North American field guide, you'll see a wren fly by and you'll open up the section, the wren section, and you'll see like, I don't know how many wrens we've got, 18 wrens, and you'll just be like, oh my God, they all, you know, and the sparrow section will just be like humongous and you'll just throw the book, you know, out the window or something like that. So start, start with uh, birds of the east at least, or maybe of North Carolina is a great way to go. Look closely at field marks. Again, what I'm talking about there is when you look at a specific bird, be sure to note there'll be little arrows that say, look at this part in particular. In the beginning, you might be just like, duh, like I just wanna see that the bird is blue. Why are you telling me that there's an arrow to look at its beak? You know, I just wanna see, is it blue, is it not blue? But trying to tell the difference between a blue grosbeak beak and an indigo bunting, one of the field markers is pointing right here to this wing bar. And that way, when you see one of these blue birds come to your feeder, you know right away, I'm gonna look at the beak and I'm gonna look at the wing. And then I'll know if it's an indigo bunting or a blue gross beak. Because you might have them both at your feeder, especially here in the Hendersonville Mills River area. Um, both of these birds are pretty common. Um, so looking for field marks, there's little hints that you can learn in the book that you'll start to just memorize. Oh, does it have white outer tail feathers? Maybe it's a towhee or a mockingbird and field marks will help you with that. Drawings over photos. I prefer books that have drawings or paintings in them rather than photographs 
because the artist can put the bird in the exact angle it wants. It can highlight the feature that they want to highlight and it's separate from its habitat. Now, in some ways, it would be nice to see the bird in its habitat because that's what you'll want to be practicing otherwise. But I really enjoy it when there isn't a confusing background and instead I can just focus on the details of the bird. The habitat will usually be mentioned, I'm sure, in here, if I could read it, that they would tell us that the yellow-throated warbler is associated with sycamore trees in riparian zones, for example. Again, if you have a bird book that has photos in it, totally doable. A lot of people use photos and really like it. Some people prefer it. Um, I think for beginning, it's really helpful for me to, to see drawings. Reference in range maps, seasonal distribution. Over here, you'll see that there's different colors and they're telling us where the bird is gonna be in the United States. Okay, I can rule this one out right away, Grace's Warbler, because it doesn't look like it comes in North Carolina. I could cross my fingers and try to make some bird that I saw, right? I could try to make this yellow-throated warbler into a Grace's Warbler and be like, but I'm sure. And very likely at some point you'll snap a picture and be like, okay, it was actually a yellow throat warbler, which is a beautiful bird to see. Range map will really help you try to figure out what the likelihood is that you've got something rare or not rare. Here you can see a little blue in Florida. That's where this bird, yellow throated warbler, winters. It might also, looks like it's coming down into Mexico. It might go way down here. We're not getting the full winter range. We're just getting the range in the United States. The color red, is the area where it breeds. And this is the Kaufman's Guide. I'm not positive what pink means. I think pink is occasional. So uh, rarely it comes out of the red zone into these pink zones on the edges. That might be small for you all to see. But just read the introduction of your book for sure and be sure to know what the different colors mean. They'll usually tell you where it is in winter, what area it migrates through is often one color, and then uh, where it actually breeds and raises its young is another color. Habitats and behavioral notes, we're gonna get into that in just a minute. This is just two examples of field guides. Here's the Peterson's field guide showing us some of the buntings. By the way, if you wanna head down towards the coast, the coast of North and South Carolina are great places to see the painted bunting. I think both the male and the female are just beautiful birds. Also just noticing here, a nice example given with the indigo bunting, here's a mature male in full blue. In the winter time though, that male is actually gonna turn brown just like the female and the young are gonna be brown too. It takes the male a year, if not two, to become fully blue like this. Matter of fact, when you see a young male, he may be patchy, he may have patches of brown and patches of blue, and they may just be like molted all different colors. Kind of a cool thing to see. In the fall time, all the males are gonna start turning into brown and blue birds. Really, really neat. This is the indigo bunting again. Here's the female. That would be a hard bird to identify right there if you didn't have a song or if you didn't get a good look at the beak. It's kind of a, just a little brown bird, it's not real descript, LBB. Listening and silhouettes, I already talked a bit about the silhouettes. It's just something that you wanna spend time with. Keep looking in the back of the book. They'll write what the silhouettes are on the page next to it so you can quiz yourself a little bit. Um, try going out birding at dusk. You know what I did for my first eight years of birding? I bird it with this ancient pair of binoculars that barely had any ability to bring color through. It was basically like birding with a black and white TV, you know, and it was just I, like I could barely see anything. And, and I'd be looking at some warblers up in a tree and my buddy would be like, well, you see, I was like, how do you know that's a palm warbler? You know, he's like, well, you see the yellowish here and the rufous cap? I'm like, no, I don't see that at all. And then he was like, oh, let me see your binoculars. Oh, try these and handed me his binoculars, which is the pair I'm using now. And, um, and I was like, oh, yeah, these birds have color. Okay, the books aren't totally exaggerating. It was my binoculars. At the same time, as much as you know, that might have meant my learning was slow for learning the colors, I got really good at the silhouettes. I'm super glad for that. You know, now it's like I see a silhouette of a bird flying in dusk or dawn light, and I can often tell what it is. Not always. Every single day I have birds I cannot identify by sight or sound. Every day. And you know, and I know I know the birds pretty well. So just just right, yeah. It's not just you, Joyce. It's not just you know, we're we're together in this. Are there any bird listers in here? Let me start off with that. All right, we got a bird lister. There's all different kinds of listing, and for a while I kind of poo pooed listing because there are some folks who list in a way where as soon as they've seen a bird once in their life, they check it off and they think they're done. They're just like, oh yeah, cool, Baltimore Oriole. Check, done. Next time you tell me you see a Baltimore Oriole, I'm just gonna be like, oh cool, it's okay, I'm busy. 
You know, they just want to see it once and they get the check and they think they're done. So I don't want to encourage that kind of listing. Um, however, um, I've always said I'm not a lister, but I started playing some games sometimes where I would try to go out and I would try to see how many birds I could see in a day. And I just was interested in like, oh, I got, I got all the way to 29 birds today. Gosh, if I just spend another hour, maybe I'll get a 30th bird, you know. And, uh, and, and I started that way, just having a little fun contest with myself. How many birds can I see in a winter day or a rainy day or a spring day? I was spending some time in the Chesapeake Bay with my family, and I thought it was winter, it was, it was January, and I was like, I wonder how many different birds I could possibly see in a day. Well, I have to find out how many birds could be in this area. So I started flipping through those range maps and writing down all the birds. I ended up writing down like over a hundred birds and I realizing that a lot of them I didn't know. And I was like, oh my gosh, I thought I was good at birding and here I am like with a list of dozens of birds I've never seen before, waterfowl I've never heard of, ducks I don't know about, like here's all these birds, here's two wrens I don't even know. Um, what it's ended up helping me with is I, at some point I decided I would try to see birds I haven't seen before and what it made me do was read about them and try to figure out where these birds are. I know house wren now, I know winter wren, I know Carolina wren, but where does the marsh wren live? Okay, it lives in marshes, I got that one. What about the sedge wren? Like sedge, isn't that related to grasses or to graminoid, okay, carex? Yeah. Um, where does the sedge wren live? I need to read about its specific habitat. And at some point, if I decide I wanna add sedge wren to my list, I'm going to have to learn about it to do it. So in that regard, I just want to say that like there's this cool little thing with like keeping a year list, how many birds you get to see in a year, maybe a life list, maybe just a yard list of what are all the birds that have ever passed through your yard. Um, but go through the book and try to see what ones you haven't seen. And if they're birds that you don't have to drive three hours for, or don't have to fly for, like maybe make a little effort to go see them. I don't encourage people to try to go around the world just birding and like putting a huge amount of fossil fuels and resources into the hobby of birding. Uh, but you get to make that decision for yourself. Sometimes I drive a little out of my way to see a cool bird for sure. Um, and, but where's the sweet spot between like not over uh, using our precious resources or causing pollution that ends up being detrimental to bird habitat rather than um, doing things to preserve birds? I don't know. So I put up this example of uh, Orioles here, just to show that in our area, we have Orchard Orioles really pretty commonly, Baltimore Orioles as well. But maybe you look at a page like this and say, oh, there's Bullocks Orioles and Spot-Breasted Orioles. Where do they live? And it's gonna encourage you to look at the map and see where they are, how often they show up here, don't show up there. Both are more westerly species, but occasionally, at least Bullocks Oriole rarely will fly into Eastern United States and get a big following of birders who are trying to, trying to see it. It's a beautiful bird, big, big white wing bar. And it's just gonna draw you into details of attention that you might not notice otherwise. Okay, this one has a little black throat patch. Oh, so does the immature orchard oriole. Okay, well, how would I know it? Bird song. I'm gonna play this one for you on my phone. The bobolink is a bird mostly of great open grasslands. It likes the low grass prairies and the mid grass prairies. I think it even lived a little bit in the tall grass prairies. And bobolink is in the Ictiridae, it's in the blackbird family. And these birds make some really cool noises. I remember walking into uh, an area in Nebraska where they had preserved native grassland. There's not much native grassland left. Most of it's been turned into agricultural area. And, uh, and I remember uh, wondering like, what is the medicine of this kind of natural habitat? You know, like the forest just really moved me. Like right away you walk into an old forest and you just got poetry spewing out, you know, it's just a beautiful place to be. But the grassland had an interesting and different feel. And I was wondering like, what are the qualities of it? What in it will I find that's magic? And all of a sudden I heard the bobolink singing and I'm gonna play you one, but I want you to realize that these birds being blackbird family, they tend to be in big groups. And sometimes you'll get 50 or 100 or 200 males singing a song like this. Let's try another one.
R2 D2? <laughs> So bird song we've talked about a bit this morning. Um, who can remember? I'll start quizzing you all to try to keep you awake. It's warm in here, huh? What's one reason why a bird might utilize song in its day? Stakeout its territory. Stakeout its territory. Many species will even fly around their t edges of their territory, which may not be a circle. It might be elongated along a river, or a creek, or the edge of a field. But they're going to fly their territory, singing their song, letting other male birds know this is my spot. It's not necessarily aggressive. Sometimes it's as simple as, as me being like, hey, I'm gonna build my cabin over here. I'd like to use this section of woods. Will you use that section over there? Other times it could be aggressive. There's times when it's just like, hey, this is my spot. No, this is my spot. Cool thing is a lot of species of birds will end up doing a sing-off to try to settle their arguments. And they'll hang out and they'll sing back and forth at each other, just wild and loud. And at some point, one of them will just be like, all right, you got it. You can tell I got it, it's good. Um, I'm going to play you another bird that I was just hearing up at Mount Mitchell uh, a couple days ago. This is a winter wren. That is a tiny bird. It's smaller than a Carolina wren by far. Probably weighs about as much as a nickel. It's got that teeny little tail and doesn't have the bright eye stripe that the Carolina wren has. It doesn't have the warm buffy breast. Instead, it's rather muted and secretive. And it has one of the longest songs of any of our songbirds locally. A beautiful song. Again, it's just down here in the winter time. It doesn't sing much. Then this time of year, most of them go way north. A few of them head up to the high elevation spruce fir forest. And there you can go up to Mount Mitchell or up into the Smokies. Once you get to the, to the, um, the balsams, the spruce and the fir trees, you'll start hearing this. Beautiful, huh? What a magical little creature. Again, I'll mention that there's a, a, a particular cool moment with song, which we call the dawn chorus, which is early in the morning, just before the sun rises. Uh, many, many species, particularly in the springtime in our area and temperate areas are gonna all just start singing. And actually there's an African myth that I found that talks about um, that they're not singing because the sun's coming up, but they're actually singing the sun up. Like the birds needed to sing in order to pull the sun up into the sky and give motivation. I thought that was really sweet. Um, and just to say, uh, you know, I love the dawn chorus. It's important for us to realize that because of the tropics, um, almost any moment of, of any day, of every day, almost any moment of every day, there's a dawn chorus going on somewhere as we spin and the sunlight is cruising around our planet. Somewhere on some island or in a jungle or in an equatorial area, there is very often a dawn chorus happening in our planet. And just to note that as the sunlight is, uh, you know, as our planet is spinning and the sunlight is going around and around our planet, that that, that dawn chorus is actually spinning around our planet and it doesn't stop at any point. It continues to go. So there may be- It's the Earth song. It's the Earth song, absolutely. And, and I just, it's one of my favorite things about birds is just to know that they hold a space for a song to be like spiraling around our planet consistently, likely for millions and millions of years. You know, like I feel like if I always say, if I went to like the inter, intergalactic cosmic gathering uh, and had a little like name tag that said like, you know, Luke learning dear earth, uh, and they'd be like, oh, you're from Earth. And they probably have a number of things to say, but we'll, at some point someone would be like, oh, that's the planet where the bird song just like spins around nonstop. Oh, I've always wanted to go on vacation there. Like, yeah, like, is, is that cool or what? And I'd be like, well, most humans sleep through it. And they'd be like, what? Are you crazy? Uh, especially here in the temperate zones where we mostly have it in the spring. We'll have it a little bit in the summer and fall, but primarily it's in the spring. And we've just passed peak. Uh, but there's still a good dawn course if you wake up. Pretty soon they're pretending to they're young and they're going to be trying to be a lot more subtle. So. There's research where they, they correlated this bird song with helping plants grow and blossom in spring. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. It helps me get out of bed in the morning. I'm just like, oh, okay, it's hard world. My work is hard. I don't get paid much, but it's beautiful out there. I'm just going to go teach some birds.